Let's look at color in the ocean. And we've just described how the intensity of light decreases, but as it turns out, the color of the light changes. Some colors are absorbed more quickly than other colors in the visible light spectrum. The color dependent absorption of something for, like water, for example, is described by a separate attenuation coefficient, something called absorption coefficients. So for each wavelength of light, water, for example, has a specific absorption coefficient, how much light it absorbs of a particular wavelength or of a particular color. Following me? So if we look at the absorption of light as the different colors in the ocean, we get a graph that looks something like this, figure 729 in your book. Red light is absorbed very quickly. Violet light is also absorbed fairly quickly. In other words, it doesn't penetrate very deeply. As it turns out, red light is the most rapidly absorbed and we get no red light between below on average 15 meters. There's no red light deep in the ocean. So if you've ever scuba dived and cut yourself and looked at yourself bleeding, you didn't bleed red, you bleeded blue. And it had nothing to do with the fact that you were underwater or that you were maybe dying or something. It just had to do with the fact that there's no red light available to light up your blood and make it turn red at that particular depth. Orange and yellow are the next to go. Indigo and blue, as you can see in this figure, and here's their wavelengths. And I asked to remember 445, and I asked to remember, uh, and actually this would probably be shifted over a little bit, these wavelengths of light penetrate the deepest in the ocean. And so if you're asking why is the ocean blue, this graph simply explains it. It's blue because blue is the color that is absorbed the least in the world ocean. Blue is a color that seawater absorbs less than any other colors. So water and seawater absorb all these other colors first, leaving blue behind. And that's why, simply speaking, that's why the ocean is blue, because water absorbs all other colors first, leaving the blue behind. Okay. So, if you look at Table 7.3 in your book, you'll see a listing of absorption coefficients. And if you go down the columns, you'll find that at a particular wavelength, we have maximum absorption of blue light or of light. And at a particular wavelength, we have minimal absorption. And what you find then by looking at that table of absorption coefficients, table 7.3, you'll find that 430 to 450 nanometers are the wavelengths that are least absorbed by water. The blue light that is not absorbed, scatter back to your eyes, the ocean has its blue color appearance. Okay, so now you know why the ocean is blue. In some cases, the ocean may actually be green. Why is that? It turns out that phytoplankton, these photosynthetic microscopic organisms that I have said are the most important organisms in the ocean because they provide food, they provide oxygen, they provide warmth, and that's a pretty good friend indeed, they contain the pigment called chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is the same pigment you see in the trees and palms and grass that you have around your home. That green pigment because it's green means that it's absorbing all other colors except green, right? So even though we don't need to go into the details of that right now, it turns out that the maximum wavelength of absorption by chlorophyll is this 430 to 450 nanometers. Wait a minute, where have we heard that before? Water absorbs 450 to 430 to 450 the least. Plants 
absorb that the most. Does that make sense? The plants are absorbing the color of light that's the most available. Voila! How smart those plants are. Makes sense, doesn't it? If you have a color of light that's the most available in the ocean, and as it turns out, the most available color of the light in the sky, that's a color you should absorb if you're trying to use that light energy. And in fact, phytoplankton have tuned their photosynthetic apparatus to be able to maximize the amount of blue light that they absorb. I think that's simply amazing. And we're going to talk more about that when we get into chapter 13 and talk about phytoplankton. So the upshot of this is when you see water that is green, it's got lots of phytoplankton. And if it's got lots of phytoplankton, then it's healthy and productive. No need to be afraid of green water. It's good. I mean, unless it's really slimy and, you know, the really stanky green stuff. But if you go out to the ocean and it's not clear blue water, there's nothing wrong with that water. That's a healthy, productive ecosystem. It's really what makes uh, the fish uh, fishing off of our coast used to be so productive. It's what brings blue whales to our coast and all the other kinds of marine mammals because we have a really healthy productive waters compared to other regions that don't have that. So green water is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It means a healthy plant life growing in the water. All right, so let's take just kind of a little summary um, of all the things we've learned in all these lectures, and this has certainly been the longest set of lectures that we've had so far. The physics of the ocean really starts with the molecular properties of water, especially those that relate to the heat, like specific heat, or latent heat of fusion, or latent heat of vaporization. It's those molecular properties of water itself that really are, that give rise to the global heat system and the global properties that we see with regards to the physics of the ocean. When we look at the seasonal cycle of solar radiation, we see that that seasonal cycle drives heating, and as we'll talk about later, it also drives photosynthesis on our planet. We've also learned that sunlight decreases in intensity as you go deeper in the water column, and it also changes in color as you go deeper in the water column. And as we get to talking about these subjects, we'll see uh, in further chapters, I'll be able to relate more to why they are important to productivity in the ocean. You might note that we left out Earth's heat budget and global warming uh, from this series of lectures. We'll get to those topics in a separate set of lectures and talk about them more in relation to global warming than the topics that we're covering here. Well, as always, if you're interested in learning more about this, I encourage you to check out the materials at the end of each chapter. There's some nice keywords there. There's some critical thinking questions that you might want to think about that might show up on, like, say, an exam. Uh, and you might check out these websites. You might watch one of these videos and take a look at some of the other materials, web links and those kinds of things available at the textbook website to really help you understand this most difficult chapter. Um, we could spend the entire semester talking about ocean physics, physics, of course, then we wouldn't be able to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is phytoplankton. But understandably, it's a lot to take in. It's a lot to kind of digest and a lot to understand. But once you understand it, the ocean will appear in a much different way than it ever has before and you'll have an understanding of the ocean in a way that will really just make you appreciate it even more than you may appreciate it now.